Alright, so we know a little bit about thermal blackbody spectra. That tells us the temperature of an object but nothing else. I'm going to need to know more than that. And fortunately, there is a way to know more than that. It turns out that, well, you know, these opaque objects, they, they emit their thermal blackbody spectrum. But now we need to talk about light from transparent gases. Light from transparent gases. And this is even more useful. So here's how it works. Um, if I have a gas, well, that means all the atoms are individually bouncing around. And well, how, how does that generate light? So let's think about that. Light and, and gases, well, the, the atoms are all bouncing around individually, so let's think about atoms. What's an atom? Well, we know how an atom works. It has those uh, positively charged protons at the center, along with the neutrally charged neutrons, and then it's orbited around that. Then we got these, these electrons. We got these negatively charged electrons bound to it, something like that. So there's, there's, a, there's a quick schematic idea of an atom. Let's make it even simpler. Let's do the simplest possible atom. The simplest atom is hydrogen. Hydrogen has one proton at the center, one positively charged proton in the center. It's nucleus. That's most of its mass. It has one electron around that. Now, suppose I'm an atom. I'm a hydrogen atom, and I want to give off a photon of light. Well, first of all, it's got light's got to be given off in photons. An atom gives off either one photon or no photons. It can't give off half a photon or part of one. So it's going to either going to give off a photon or it doesn't. And so how does it do that? Well, a photon contains energy. That energy has to come from somewhere. Energy can't be created or destroyed. There's one of the great laws of the universe. Um, so if an atom emits a photon of light, it means it has to, the, the energy contained in the atom has to go down. So where does the energy come from? Atoms store their energy, one of the main way as far as we're concerned, in the orbits of their electrons. Atoms store energy in electron orbits. And here's the idea. Um, it's that positive charge of the, uh, of the proton which holds that negatively charged electron, binds it to the atom. So the more energy the electron has, the more it can fight that off and the farther it can get from the nucleus. And if you gave it enough energy, well then the electron could leave the atom completely, go off and explore space all by itself, and then the atom would be what we would call ionized. It no longer has an individual electron bound to an individual nucleus anymore. But no, we're talking about the bound state. So, in order for an atom to give off energy, that electron, since atoms store energy in electron orbits, uh, far from nucleus, means high energy, close to nucleus, close to nucleus means low energy. In order to give off a photon of light, the atom has to, the electron, an electron has to go from an, an orbital that's far from the nucleus to one that's closer to the nucleus. So the electron up here has to go down to a closer orbit. It's lost energy, and in order to, in, in doing so, it can then give off a photon of light which can go out into the universe, and then I, as an astronomer, can detect this. Okay, so interesting. So far, so good. Electrons, nucleus, the electron moves closer to the nucleus. I don't know how the electron got the energy in the first place. Maybe there's thermal energy. It's bouncing around, bounces off another atom. The electron absorbs some of that energy, and then it, it gets to a high energy state, and then it hops down, and the atom can then give off a photon of light. So that's interesting, and that's wonderful. And whenever people think of atoms, they're thinking of, they, they usually kind of imagine it's kind of like the solar system. You know, it's like the Earth going around the sun while the electron goes around the nucleus. Eh, eh, you know, okay, well, in, in our solar system, it's the, the attractive force of gravity rather than the elect attractive electromagnetic force, but you know. But in a, in a very deep way, electrons orbiting around protons behave totally differently than, uh, than planets orbiting around the sun. Our Earth could orbit the sun, it currently orbits the sun, at a distance of 93 million miles. It could orbit at any distance away from the sun. There's no reason it has to be 93. It could be 94. It could be 92. You, if you were to somehow, using rocket engines, give the Earth more orbital energy, it would orbit farther from the sun. Or if you were to take it away, the Earth could spiral in closer to the sun. And if you could take energy away or add it to it, so it could orbit at any difference, distance from the sun. What we find is that in individual electrons, uh, orbiting around individual atoms can only orbit at certain very specific. Very, there's a, you can orbit at this distance from the nucleus or that distance from the nucleus, but you cannot orbit anywhere in between. And this has to do with electrons being not perfectly, they're not like point particles in space, they, they need a certain amount of space. They, it's, they're, they're, 
electrons behave more like waves. This gets into the whole idea of the quantum theory is that electrons are more like waves, more like musical notes resonating in a certain cavity than they are like particles like planets orbiting around the sun. And anyway, that's complicated and quantum mechanics is wonderful and please read all about it elsewhere. But from my point as an astronomer, the point here is that electrons can only orbit at certain distances away from the nucleus. It can orbit here, it can orbit there, maybe, maybe one out here, but it cannot orbit anywhere in between. These are the possible orbits and maybe there's a lot of them, but it has to go from one to the other. And since electrons are only allowed in certain orbits around the nucleus, so that's, that's, that's a fact. The electrons are only allowed in certain orbits. And since, well, to give off light, you got to move from one orbit to another orbit. And since only certain orbits are allowed, that means only certain amounts of energy can be given off as light. Only certain amounts of light energy, energy can be given off. I mean, if an electron goes from a very distant orbit all the way into a very close orbit, oh, that's a lot of energy. Maybe that's a, that's a high energy. Maybe that transition from far away to nearby, maybe that's, that's blue. Maybe that's going to give off a photon of blue light. And then, oh, this, this transition doesn't look as big. Okay, so maybe that's red. But the point is there are only certain specific energy, amounts of light energy allowed, and light energy, mm, electromagnetic spectrum, light energy corresponds to, photon energy corresponds to color. Certain colors are allowed and others are not. And this is extraordinary. This is amazing. So, okay, so this is the microscopic view. I'm zoomed in on an individual atom. Okay, here's, here's what I do in the laboratory. I take a tube of gas. It has hydrogen in it. Hydrogen gas, what do I do? I run electricity through it. I connected it up to a great big battery and I just run electricity through it. And what is the electricity? Well, it gives a whole bunch of energy to the system so it starts off to glow, glows. And so what happens is this, you know, since I'm running electricity through it, it glows. I take the light from this, I put it through a prism. Mm, let's make it more of a triangular prism. And I look at the spectrum of light that comes out of it and I don't have a full rainbow. I don't have red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. I don't have this beautiful smooth rainbow. Instead, I get certain specific colors. I get, mm, I should have had, a, <laughs> I should have had colored marker here. I get one peak in the red. Hot glowing hydrogen gas gives off one specific wavelength, one specific shade of red light. Well, lambda equals 656 nanometers. And then it doesn't give off any orange or any yellow. And then it gives off no light at all. And then it has some peak over here in the blue. And then it has some other peaks beyond that. But there's no orange, no yellow, no green that gives off only certain very specific colors. If I were to draw that diagram of intensity versus wavelength, instead of having a smooth curve like this, I would see, hmm, there's one peak here, and then there's a peak here, and then there's another peak here, and there may be others, but there's certain specific things. We call these peaks, we call these certain specific peaks that a hot glowing gas can give off, we call these emission lines. And they are spectacular particularly useful. Most of the time, most observational astronomers are looking for lines, looking for line spectra, because every type of atom produces a different pattern of emission lines. So this is the pattern for hydrogen gas. And this is hydrogen, hydrogen there's that one line and the red, and there's the blue, and there's this violet, and all this sort of thing. That's the pattern of lines from hydrogen gas. Every tube of hot glowing hydrogen gas, any blob of hot glowing hydrogen gas in the universe, gives off those specific colors. And so if I find those specific colors somewhere in the universe, it's like, oh, hydrogen. And then helium gas gives off a different pattern of colors. And hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, iron, silicon, every type of atom, every chemical element gives off a different pattern of lines. And so then when I look out at a cloud of blow, hot glowing gas out in the universe, I can then see, ooh, here's the pattern of lines from hydrogen. There's some hydrogen in the cloud. Oh, and there's some carbon. I can see that pattern of lines. And all these different patterns of lines can tell me what everything in the universe is made of. And it's even a little more complicated, but I can even tell what proportions. I can tell that this is, oh, 70% hydrogen, 28% helium, and all these different proportions of all the elements. I can measure it exactly based on the different emission lines in there. And here's another way that you can get lines. Because 
Let's go back to the atom again. If I have this atom sitting here, there's, there's my, my plus charge, there's my electron, and here's a photon of light coming along, well, just like the atom can only give off certain specific colors, each chemical element can only absorb certain specific colors. Each chemical can only absorb certain colors. Why? Because, oh well, it can only go, it can't hop up to any distance from the nucleus. It's either here or here or the energy level above that. And so, you know, you can either go this way or you can go that way. But if this is red and this is blue, well, then that means you can't, you can't absorb yellow because that would take you to an energy level you're not at. And so that means that the chemical element, in a sense, in each, each chemical can only absorb certain colors. And the colors absorbed are at, hmm, at the same wavelengths that would be emitted. If hot. Because the gaps in between the electron energy levels are the same. It just matters if you're going closer to the nucleus, you give off a photon. If you go farther from the nucleus, you absorb the photon. And so what that means is if I have some hot glowing opaque object, so I have a hot glowing opaque object, theoretically now let's call it a star, and then it's surrounded by a layer of transparent gas. Well, stars are, you know, they're made of big blobs of gas, very dense, very opaque in the center, and then they've got this transparent gas. Transparent gas surrounding it. Stars have atmospheres, they have gas surrounding them. So here, out of this, we get a thermal black body spectrum, a nice smooth curve, and then it goes through the gas. And what does the gas do? The gas, the thin transparent gas, can absorb certain specific colors. So it absorbs those colors out. And so what comes out of that is what we call an absorption line spectrum. It has this smooth curve. There's intensity, there's wavelength, but then it's got these little dips in there, these little gaps these little dark lines. If you, if you just spread it out into a rainbow, people did this with the sun. They spread out the sun's light into a rainbow very, very precisely, and you discovered that there are thousands of tiny little dark lines in there, little gaps in the colors that have been absorbed by all the different chemicals the sun is made of, and you find that every chemical element is, has a little bit in the sun, and each one creates a different pattern of lines. And so this is an absorption line spectrum. And we know that throughout the whole entire universe, in all the hydrogen creates has this line at 656 nanometers, and that's what it has. And there's one even more cooler thing on top of this. Since these are so narrow, narrow lines, you know, lambda equals 656, not 657 nanometers. This means that these lines, if they, if they move, if they, as an object moves, if a star is moving away from it, it's going to stretch out the wavelength of light a little bit. And in a process called the Doppler effect, this allows us to use the Doppler effect. The Doppler effect is what happens when an object giving off light or absorbing light or whatever, giving off light is moving. If it's moving towards us, its light waves get compressed. And or if it's moving away from it, its light waves get stretched out. And so if we measure that, if we find that hydrogen line, and it's not exactly at 656 nanometers, say it's longer, well, then that means the object must be moving away from us. And if we find it's a little bit shorter, it means the object must be moving towards us. Doppler effect is moving towards us. Wavelength gets shorter. And moving, moving away. Lambda gets longer. It's called this is called blue shift. Blue shift. This is called red shift. And this allows us to measure not only the exact chemical composition, but now the velocity of every object in the universe.